one, year two, year three, year four. It's just another way to differentiate. Probably a secondary school and IP school. So your child will not be able to, or there's no need for the uh, uh, your child to take the O-level. So after year four, your child will go to JC1 and JC2 to take the A-levels. So to enter these schools, the cutoff point, say, for example, is 250, 260. So if your child is quite weak, um, at 220, 230, your child will not be able to get in to the IP school. But via the DSA, your child is able to enter. So for example, if a child has been playing basketball, soccer for many years, and these schools are looking for students you know, who are talented in that area. And many times it's actually to build right, the school's team so that at national levels, the school is able to achieve you know, stellar results. Okay, so one way is to get foreign import, so to speak, right? So one way is to open up to DSA students who are not that uh, academically uh, inclined, so to speak, you know, not able to meet the cutoff point of 250 or 260, is able to get into, for example, NGC, even with a point, uh, uh, a PSI score of 210 or 220. Okay, so in a sense, if you ask me, is it disadvantage? In a sense that DSA is for that reason that if the child is weak, he or she is still able to get into these schools. Now, but the other side of the coin is that do be mindful because your child may struggle when he gets into the school because he or she will be, so to speak, mixing with uh, students who are at a higher T-score, right? In the, in the sense of their academic uh, ability. So the, your child may struggle through or very likely to struggle uh, these IP schools. Right, but I wouldn't say that it's uh, all lost because these schools normally try to take good care of the DSA students, knowing that they are quite weak uh, in their studies. So it's not like um, it's impossible, but I would say it is a struggle. It's going to be tough. Okay, but uh, again, it depends on a different uh, uh, child, you know what I mean? And also the, the child's perseverance, greed, and also parents' support. Okay, so I hope I answer your question, Jingwen. I think Jenny is asking what are the key things to note when preparing your child for DSA? Uh, I'll be covering this probably next month or, or later on uh, when you are preparing your child to go for DSA interview. I think I can actually hold another uh, workshop on how to ace the interview, what to prepare for the interview. We don't really have time today uh, for this. It's, I think it's to rather to decide uh, to DSA, you know, to apply for DSA. I believe the application date uh, will end 1st of June. Right, so I think there's this very, uh, you're quite anxious, you know, to whether to DSA or not, which school to DSA. Okay, for Carol would be, how will DSA placement assessment tasks, tests and interview be conducted in the light of COVID situation? <laughs> okay, wonderful questions because they can only do online right now, you know, so your, your child is definitely going to go for an interview. And during the interview, they will actually ask you to play the piano, <laughs> play the, you know, the instruments, um, definitely not able to play basketball in front of a, you know, of Zoom. But yes, definitely it'll be a very rigorous uh, interview. And then uh, if you are uh, playing for musical instruments, uh, you you will be asked to play the musical instruments, right? Because that's doable, but not for sports, right? You cannot be running <laughs> at the Zoom uh, Zoom interview. Okay, and if it's about uh, other, other aspects of it, like leadership, uh, math, science, and all that, they may ask you uh, more academic questions or to get your past results. Okay, well, I think answering the questions will fill up the time really. I only have a few more minutes because I'd like to hand over to, to Carrie. Okay, how will DSA placement be conducted? That's what I answered already. Use what to, your, uh, what to DSA, my son is strong academically and how to choose what school. Okay, this one I think you can um, look at the MOE website and also go to the school website. They will actually give you more information, okay? Like uh, uh, this particular school, like Chong Chongqing High, you know, in the school website, they will be, give, give, be able to give you more information like what kind of uh, talent, so to speak, program that they have. 
and the area of, uh, that they are opening up for BSc. Okay, do they look at the academic? Um, I'm sure they will look at the academic because they also want to see whether are you too far off, right? Because there is a chance that your child may struggle when you get into school. So I wouldn't say that it is entirely no, but they will definitely look at look at um, the talent uh, and the DSA area that your child is going in for, plus you know the academic results. Okay, whether is it compulsory? Okay, some a bit more technical. Uh, if you can find out from the MOU website, uh, would be good. But yes, you have to look at your CCA, especially if you're applying for a, a sports group, for example, in a secondary school, then they will definitely look at the primary school CCA. Okay, so let's see. Wow, there are still quite a few questions. I'm not too sure that I can answer right now. Maybe for the last two questions like Rebecca and why for the IP stream and about shortlisting, I'll leave it to the end so that we, for those who are more interested in DSA questions, even for myself, I can stay up to 10 or 10.30 just to help answer or give you more insights about DSA. So I'll encourage parents who are very, very interested in uh, to talk a little bit more about DSA. You can stay behind um, after the whole sessions and I'll definitely make time for you. Is that okay? I think Megan is also asking for DSA questions. Okay, because uh, of, of time, I really like to um, introduce, and uh, let me see whether I can take the slide because there are some slides there where I want to introduce Carrie. Okay, but I think there's some technical issue with my PowerPoint. Okay, but um, Carrie, let's see, where are you? I'm trying to look for you from the Zoom. Let's see. Hello, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, I'm trying to look for you, but I couldn't, but never <laughs> mind. I can hear you. Oh, great. Now I can see you. Okay. Okay, parents, I'd like to um, quickly introduce Carrie. So as I mentioned earlier, she's a, a, a trained, uh, not just a trained counselor, right? But you're really involved in uh, um, family relationships. So I'm going to give you uh all the time right now to 9 30 to even introduce yourself a little bit more and uh, i'm going to facilitate and at the same time ask the parents to you know if they have any questions to put in the chat box if there's a need to i may just uh, interrupt very quickly and uh, ask the questions that are related to what, what you'll be sharing mm -hmm. so okay carry sure sure yes okay carry all yours and thank you again thank you for, for joining us today Okay, I hope that all of you can see uh, the screen. Is it being shared already? Are you able to see the yeah, screen, screen share? Yes, can see. Okay, that's yes. great. So I can tell uh, many parents are here because of the DSA, uh, uh, you know, concerns for your children. And, uh, you know, Andrew has very kindly invited me to share a bit about setting boundaries for your children. So, you know, let me just begin by, uh, you know, welcoming you to this session. And in this short time that I have, I'm hoping to share with you a little bit about the necessity for boundaries uh, in our parenting, how the funnel of freedom and responsibility works, uh, rules, and how you can set them effectively. Uh, also, the best ways to use consequences. And of course, uh, you know, some problem solving and end with a perspective about, you know, setting boundaries for yourself as a parent as well. Uh, everything okay? All can hear me properly? Good. Can hear me properly? Yes. Yes, I see. Okay. All right. That's good. All right. So let me begin. Um, I want you to imagine with me a large field about a dozen boys running around. And you know, um, Andrew comes and gives them a ball, okay? Uh, and then one of them picks up the ball and throws it up in the air. Another tries to catch it, but it falls so far off. And the boy nearest to it dribbles away from other kids, only to find another boy crashing right into him. And then soon they are both wrestling each other on the grass. And then what happened to the ball? Well, it's rolled off to another child who uh, gives it a very firm, hard kick, and up the ball flies, you know, right into the air, and it lands somewhere really far off. But he doesn't want to pick it up. 
and he walks off. And so the rest of the kids are quarreling, who's going to go and get the ball? And one of them is being pushed to pick up the ball. And after a while, he doesn't come back. Where's he? A few of them finally found their friend lying in a patch on the field with the ball, daydreaming. Gosh, as you can tell by now, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of disharmony in this playtime. By the end of the day, the group that started out as friends are now enemies. And that's a problem, isn't it? Well, now imagine this huge empty field gets cleared up and four white lines are drawn onto it like a rectangle. Then a midline cuts the space into two. And at the end of the two sides, there are goal poles installed. And imagine the coach comes to the children and gives them clear rules for the game. They learn the objective of the game. They learn to put the ball into the goal poles. They are briefed what they can and they cannot do with their hands or feet and bodies and with each other. And then they are told how long the game will last, who will be playing against who, and then the whistle goes off, the game starts. At the end of the game, the children stop competing and they all sit down together for a drink. Now, how different is this scenario from the previous one? What happened? You know, the game of soccer is perhaps a small example of the many boundaries that human beings need in this real game of life. And we know that we need boundaries to understand what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to do them? When and who we need to do them with? And this is how we coexist well in family, in society, and grow as a humanity. But a common misunderstanding is that to think that, well, boundaries are bad for us. You know, it curbs our freedom. It limits our imagination. And sometimes when um, I talk to young people, and I like to show this picture, all right, sometimes. And it, says, it shows here that on, the, on, on one side, the fish inside the water, all right? And fish are meant to exist in their habitat, right? Uh, the sea or the fish tank in which there's water is where they are able to thrive and live and move and do all the things that a fish wants to do. But imagine this fish says, I don't want to keep these boundaries. And it jumps out to the water and where it was free to roam and, you know, it went out into the place where there's air and then onto the land. Unfortunately, this fish is not going to become Ariel, the Disney mermaid princess who meets a handsome prince. This goldfish would have jumped from real freedom into its own destruction. Now, I know this is not a horror movie talk, so let me stress my point here. Without boundaries in family and society, there is no order. And without clear communication of expectations, there can be no responsibility. So without shared goals and direction, how are we going to have harmony or progress, right? Well, another important picture that I want you to have tonight, um, you know, is really understanding this whole parenting funnel. So on this axis, we have the age of a child. And I've indicated every six years as a season that parenting actually goes through a season of change as well, right? Now, and on the right here, we see that the, the funnel that indicates the level of autonomy and responsibility that children of each of these age groups should have. Now, from zero to six years old, our parenting task really is to establish authority and discipline and to be in full control so that we are able to provide our children with the needed safety to grow up well. This is also the time when we lay the foundation for their habits and that's going to actually take them through all of life, believe it or not. And then in the seven to 12 years, in the primary school years, it is that whole uh, parenting uh, authority that takes us into a kind of like a trainer, instructor role, right? And our focus is on training them in character and competency. As the child grows even older and older, right? Then we're talking about the teenage years. 
And here is where we start to become like a coach, right? There is a difference because a coach um, is like, imagine field and tr uh, track and field kind of coach, right? When the people are not in, in the competition, you, they are actually taught in, in like an instructor or trainer. They would have to go through all kinds of exercises, resilient training, and then they have to run round and round or even 2.4 every week, you know, to test their speed and test themselves. But then by the time they come to the competition, the coach actually stands at the side and the child is uh, in the uh, field playing they're in on the track running right and here the coach is uh, there to actually um, cheer the, the child on right or to encourage uh, maybe correct the child um, hey look you know you're not sprinting properly you're not doing something uh, as well and here's where you can do better and then of course there are times when the match didn't go well and you know there's disillusionment and so there's a lot of talking uh, therapy going with the child to uh, encourage them and of course basically to build their responsibility and also independence then of course by the time a child goes into that 19 to 25 years old here parenting changes again and that's where you become now a mentor, right? You don't uh, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, you know, need to train them on, in everything. You don't talk to them about everything, but then whenever they need to uh, advise or as they go through some of the real decisions that uh, young adults need to make, right? You're there to advise them. And, uh, you know, this relationship is one of interdependence because, hey, we also learn from them even as they continue to learn from us and accept our influence. And so in this parenting funnel that we are looking at and the various seasons a parent goes through, we also, it, it also actually makes great sense for children because developmentally, it fits into every, uh, each of the tasks that they need for, uh, at each stage. Now, from zero to six years old, and most of you parents would know by, uh, by now, the child really needs a very secure base from which they would learn how to trust the world and trust the environment around them. And when parents are able to give them that sense of clarity and security, they learn to develop a, a clear sense of themselves. And then they learn to have that uh, initiative and confidence to move out of the world to explore, right? And so this is also the time when the children are cuters, right? But uh, this is also the time when they, they, they are absorbing like sponges. So when children are well uh, uh, taken care of, when they are well encouraged, and when they have a sense of uh, security, that helps them to really take in everything that's necessary for their foundation in life. And then the next stage is really um, where most of you are now. Children that actually feel that, um, and they have been helped to overcome their learning challenges, all right? So people like, uh, 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 you know, a teacher, they are, they're really wonderful to be helping, uh, you know, so many students uh, in all of the uh, academic stresses, right? Uh, but, you know, we know all our children have weaknesses and sometimes they have fear, fear about a particular subject or even fear about uh, uh, climbing a, 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 a hill or something like that, you know? They, these are all learned behaviors, but they can be overcome. And a child that actually learns uh, to manage their time and uh, do their work well and overcome some of their fears actually grows in the confidence they grow in their industry which means that they are growing in their competency right and of course their converse is also true because during this period when there's maybe um, uh, an exceptional 
uh, stress or uh, a very uh, scary or fearful setback, right? Uh, that can also generate a lot of inferiority in them. And uh, sometimes the more they feel that, you know, they don't measure up, that kind, that kind of uh, uh, inner kind of uh, fears, the inner state of mind can actually contribute uh, to the uh, insecurity at this age as well. But this is the task where when parents are there to train and instruct and help them along, right? That's where you can actually uh, uh, help them to become more and more competent and they become uh, confident about their future. But of course, there is always the difficult stage that we call, right? This is the stage of teenagers. And, uh, you know, some of you may be thinking about uh, what's my 12 year old gonna do, you know, and get them into the right school, it's all gonna be smooth sailing. Actually, that's gonna be um, something that you wanna be prepared for, all right? So you're gonna be a coach, but you know, you're gonna have a bunch of quite unpredictable young people. And here, the reason is because during this stage, there's a big, huge explosion in what goes on in them physically, right? Mentally, right? And uh, the way they think, the way they relate socially to different people, their peers. And that's where sometimes it gets very confusing. And you, we all know that the whole, um, you know, identity uh, crisis comes in, uh, how do they know who they are, right? And that's all the more important for them to actually be trying, doing, uh, learning to relate to different people, uh, learning to, um, you know, think about primary school with four subjects, you know, you go to secondary school and suddenly it's like seven, nine subjects for some schools, all right? And boy, their mind is blown up and, uh, but they are absorbing as well. And yet, uh, emotionally and socially, sometimes they are, are, are really very confused. And so that's all the reason why parenting is so important in this season, so to, that you can help them to integrate all that's happening in their body, in their minds, in their, up with their friends, and even what's happening at home, right? So they really need you. And of course, we know that by the time they get much older, if all of the earlier stages are well done, all right, they, they will actually move into a time where they are able to relate and be develop intimacy with people. Uh, intimacy, not just in terms of having a boyfriend, yeah, although that is also possibly a, a, a step that, you know, will come, right, but also the ability to um, uh, take care of their own um, relationships with uh, maybe people in the university, with their lecturers, with their bosses, with their first job, with the army, when they go to uh, and go through, uh, you know, difficult people as well as uh, quite nice people as well. I'm sure there are those in the army too, right? But uh, if they don't get that, you know, then they can also feel very fearful. Uh, uh, with people and then become isolated and withdrawn. But so this picture of the uh, parenting funnel, you know, has an end goal in mind. It's that as we train our children in independence, we are also wanting them to learn interdependence. And this is the end goal. And the whole parenting funnel is where you come in. Such a huge uh, you know, important uh, uh, stage that, um, you know, that you have an important role that you have as a parent. Okay, so when we come back, let me come back now to the time of the like, seven to 12 years old, and we're still worried about how can we build our child in terms of their competency, right? So, and thinking about the boundaries that we need to set up for them, okay? So, um, uh, what you don't want to happen, right, is uh, an upside down kind of parenting task, right? So if, let's say, in the earliest years, 
uh, when parents actually, when children actually need the most direction, parents, you know, kind of like abdicated their authority. And uh, the, this relationship with the children, because, you know, as the child-centered kind of parenting, right? And all the undesirable behaviors were allowed, they were ignored, they were justified, and then the child doesn't learn to restrain themselves, right? So then, of course, we might find that in the primary school years, parents might be pressured for the child to perform. And then, you know, the child is unused to being restrained, right? So all the little habits, parents might face resistance. So um, what do they do, right? So sometimes you might have be inconsistent with consequences. Sometimes you might um, be very harsh with negative punishment. Sometimes you might even bribe children to comply. Yeah, and we all do all kinds of strategies when, when, when one is frustrated. But sometimes by the time the child is in their teens, there is also a fear of losing control. And this is the time perhaps when uh, you might want to step up a lot of rules. You can't do this, you can't do that. But you know, th uh, there's little moral authority or that relationship is not so strong. And so sometimes the escalation of high conflict uh, can leave many parents feeling like, I, I just don't know what to do, I, I should give up, right? Um, and of course, by the time, you know, young adults do mishandle their freedoms or, you know, we try to maybe put in some guilt trip towards them, but it's really desperate measures at that time. And sometimes the relationship is so broken then the discipline is, well, possibly just left to external authority. Well, to be honest, I think to some degree, all of us may have experienced a little bit of these lapses that I've mentioned. And, but my point here is not to discourage anybody, but to say that, hey, you know, catch ourselves that whatever point that you may find yourself in and whatever lapses that I may have not think through my, um, on my the, you know, in the past, uh, how can I be aware of where I am right now? Okay, and how can I begin to discuss, uh, you know, maybe as a family, how to, do I re-establish the relationships? How do I uh, work on the boundaries? Okay, but of course, there's another um, uh, topic in conversation uh, altogether, right? Uh, kind of like, what do you do when things have really, really gone wrong? But let me return back again to our milestones currently right now and talk about rules now okay so the importance of uh, uh, rules right um, is this that you know where good parenting it really is about achieving a balance it's bit you know supporting and encouraging children to make good decisions for themselves on one hand but on the other hand is also uh, helping them to know the limits and here's the work of parents that you lead and you decide and not always the child leads and decides. One common mistake uh, is, uh, you know, and, and it's important to be really clear about rules because sometimes we can get confused, uh, you know, about this. And a common mistake is that we can sometimes make a lot of unnecessary rules and then insist on, uh, you know, uh, them, but the very important rules we kind of like don't quite insist upon. Um, so an unnecessary rule, for example, is like when you direct a child to do something that the child is already capable of doing and just because it's your preference, right? So for example, you say, oh, you know, you, you, you cannot uh, do your homework in this manner. You cannot sit like that. You cannot be drinking or you cannot be, um, you know, uh, having music or something like that. But, uh, you know, or you just say that um, uh, when you wash your, uh, the dishes, you know, you have to do it my way, right? So that might be an unnecessary rule. But, uh, you know, to have a lot of unnecessary rules sometimes makes uh, living together a bit stressful, right? It sometimes also stifles your child's initiative and uh, motivation for actually doing the task itself. But there are rules that are important and they ought to be emphasized, right? For example, um, uh, you know, 
rules like rudeness and inappropriate behavior, sometimes we just like brush it off and we don't uh, think about it or we don't insist on it, but it actually can allow us to have a lot of other repercussions later on with their relationships. So I'd like to just mention that there are, it's important to distinguish between core rules, negotiable rules, and the decisions that children can make for themselves, right? Core rules are rules that are most important for your children to keep. And these rules are, well, mostly quite non-negotiable uh, because you will notice them and you will highlight it. And children need to be helped, helped to keep them at, you know, as much as possible. Core rules should be kept to a minimum and they should be based on your family's vision statement and values. If you don't have one, you can sit down with your spouse, think about it. Because if you don't have a vision for your family, it could be like, oh, anything goes, right? But when your children ask you, why are these rules important? If you have a vision, uh, you'll be able to explain there's a value behind it. So for example, respect is a key value, right? And we say, we want to be a family who loves and respects each other. And so your rules can be that, well, we'll speak and do things that are considerate towards each other. We will use a polite tone when we speak to each other, right? Safety is another key value. Well, we want to keep each other safe. So we wear a seatbelt and we inform one another where we are when we and what time when we will be back, right? So that's uh, uh, the, the specifics, but it starts from the value. And if education is important to you, uh, because it does help you, right, to grow in knowledge and wisdom. And uh, your, your family core value can be that we are a family who are learners for life. Okay? And the core rule would be that we must take responsibility for our own learning and education. And that means pay attention when we're learning something. And complete your homework, right? So that's, those are the specifics. And lastly, let's say, let's talk about health. Well, we eat well, we exercise well, uh, and we sleep well, right? So why do we value health? So that we are strong. And when we're strong, we are able to help others, okay? So these are your core rules that come from your core values, right? Nice, Carrie. I just have a question for, I thought it's appropriate to ask. Because yes. it's regarding the core rule, especially the one on respect. Uh, Tingwen mm -hmm. asks here, she has kids 8, 7 and 10, mm -hmm. addicted to handphone games. <laughs> I think a lot of kids are playing a lot on the internet, watch YouTube, watch anime. And mm -hmm. then he asks, especially now with COVID, stay home. They can stay longer in screen time. If I try to take away their handphone, they will throw tantrums, throw temper. Sure. So in this case, um, what, can, what should parents do? Well, so, so this is a case where, um, uh, you know, uh, the funnel, we think about the funnel, all right? Uh, children have been given excesses and have been given the privileges before they have been able to, uh, uh, you know, keep their uh, the end of the bargain, let's say, all right? So uh, really what is important is as we go through here, later, the next, uh, uh, later on, we'll be talking more about uh, using consequences as well. And so I'm going to answer that a little bit towards the end, okay? Because I know yeah. that uh, this is a really common issue, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, let me go on to negotiable rule, okay? So these are rules where there's room for to maneuver even if the parent has the final say, okay? So it's possible to discuss and negotiate where given a guideline, the child can have some choices like following the rule. For example, if you say chores need to be done, like, you know, I can tidy the room uh, or wash the dishes, but I, which would you want to do, right? But the child can decide which ones they want and then when they will do it. So this is options, for example. Then there's a need to do, let's say, like a haircut or a dress code is needed for when you attend a wedding, dinner. You don't want them to go in slippers, right? But your child may not have a choice to attend or not attend, but then they can decide, lah, all right? At least you go to the barber or the hairdresser. How do you want your hair to be cut? What do you actually wear for the formal occasion? Okay. So with uh, older children, like teenagers, of course, the more you negotiate and involve them in discussions, right? 
actually the more that they will be more likely to respect and uphold the rules. Okay, so this is really about taking time to discuss and review the rules with your teenager. And it's really listening carefully to what they want and how they feel, okay? Um, express your concerns, what you really need from them, and then to offer choices within limits so that, you know, somehow um, this, this time of listening to one another, discussing with one another, and actually confronting one another, if I would dare to say, right, uh, would allow everyone to come together and reach some agreement. Because we know with older children, right, the, 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 the funnel, uh, the expectations for the funnel to broaden in terms of my autonomy is, must be there. They want it, right? But then again, you've got to balance up when you're, you're given more autonomy, you're also to be given more responsibility, right? So if there's a, a, a case where you just get all the autonomy without the responsibility, then, you know, how are you going, how are we going to come to some agreement? So this is something that's really need to, uh, parents really need to like, like pull back, really pull back. Well, we have to, and we need to have the difficult conversation and perhaps even the difficult confrontation. Okay, but not just at that moment, all right? And we'll talk a bit more again later. Then we'll talk about uh, decisions that children, uh, as they get older, they really should be encouraged to make more decisions. And actually, this is very important for development. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of like told that some of our 12-year-old or 13-year-olds are not even allowed to uh, take a bus home on their own. All right. And uh, is it possible that they cannot? Is it because they cannot do that? Or is it because it's not safe? Is it because they don't know how? Uh, and of course, I'm sure that many parents, who are, different parents will have different reasons for why they don't allow their child to take a bus. All right. But um, uh, a child at uh, actually seven years old, or even eight years old, uh, can already take a bus and know how to find their way home. Uh, so sometimes uh, there are many things that parents do for our children, which kind of like prevents them from being able to be um, competent, independent. Uh, and so when the, what, the decisions, of course, uh, you know, that you make uh, needs to come, uh, uh, you know, consider their development, all right? And the aim really is to uh, grow a child's competency and confidence and not be over-controlling. But that means also when you allow children to make uh, some choices, they may uh, make some bad choices and they may also make some mistakes. And that's the, uh, what, what uh, is necessary that if that happens, then it's important, so important that we are gentle and patient with them and you know, um, uh, allow them time to kind of retry. Again, when I think about being a trainer, and a coach, uh, there's, there's a, a time when you really don't want to exasperate the child to the extent that everything you cannot do, everything you don't know how to do. But you know, when they make that mistake, it's really to say, hmm, okay. Uh, you know, instead of looking at the cup being half empty, to say that, hey, the cup's half full. Instead of saying that, what is wrong with you? What's, why do you get 90 marks? Why do you lose that 10 points, you know? Uh, but to say, hey, wow, you really got that 90 marks, you know? Or, or, or even to say, hey, you, 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 you got 55. Wow, how did you do that, you know? And, and for a child to slowly learn to uh, take control of their learning, of their uh, uh, you know, responsibilities. Um, they really, really need a lot of encouragement, okay? Uh, so we want to really cheer them on. And I think too often, it's our anxiety that we highlight all their faults and we fail to uh, remember that we really need to affirm their efforts. Yeah, um, as sometimes it's, and, and really, I, I want to highlight a little bit more about efforts because, uh, you know, when children get things right, uh, sometimes there's a lot of silence, you know, kind of like today, everything went on well, and uh, they didn't, 
they didn't scream, they didn't fight with me over the computer, they didn't, uh, you know, uh, argue or anything. And so we go, they go to sleep and great, that's fine, you know. It was a good day for me as a parent. And then, but when the day happens that, you know, something went wrong, then, ah, uh, you know, they hear my scream, they hear me, you know, criticize them and I'm scolding and, Wow, then, you know, I, I keep highlighting everything that went wrong. And I think this is, uh, you know, uh, something somewhat uh, 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 kind of reverse. Uh, you know, what we should be doing is to keep highlighting everything that they've been doing right. I saw you doing your homework just now. And you know what? I, I didn't have to remind you. I'm so proud of you. You know, oh, I, I, you were, you were playing so nicely with your brother, and um, thank you for doing that. You know, and I, it's so critical for our children in these days, and especially when um, there's a lot of stress and pressure, uh, even at school, and always they're thinking about their performance. Wow, uh, encourage, encourage, encourage. Okay, so. Um, Establishing rules, all right? I'd like to say, use do rather than don't. Instead of saying, don't shout, say, ask him politely, please. Uh, do, instead of saying, don't fight, say, I, I want to see you both get along. Instead of saying, don't run off, say, I need you to stay here by my side, right? And, and you can use a when-then kind of instruction, right? When you have cleared up, then you can... When you have finished your homework, then you can, all right? Uh, be uh, encouraging, right? Sometimes it's, uh, you get a bit of resistance, okay? So, hey, listen, John, you know, let's get this done up, okay? I'm here with you. And I know it's going to just take a few minutes. And then you can play, right? So let's do it together. Well, thank you, Anne. Thank you for tidying up. That's a great help. I really, uh, you know, I'm so so glad that you 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 chipped in to help help me, right? Um, acknowledge feelings, right? Look, uh, I can see that you're upset, right? But I really need you to speak politely, right? I know that you're angry, um, or I know that uh, you you still want to play, but I need you to put it away, all right? Uh, and then it's important, uh, though, for us, uh, the problem is I think most of the time we get worked up as well. So here is this whole thing about how do we use a polite and positive and assertive tone? Because here is where, um, uh, you know, you know, when you think about the coach, right? Um, a coach models for the team the kind of attitudes and the kind of behavior that uh, you know, he wants his team members to have. So if we want our child to be uh, polite and not get angry or get worked up or to be cooperative, um, it's so important that we uh, keep calm first and then move into a positive uh, model of communication. And even it's not possible to be assertive without getting overly worked up, right? Uh, and so... Um, what we're going to do is just to watch a couple of videos right now. Uh, and I'm going to stop share here. And uh, share a different screen where you can, where I think, yeah. Being positive. What's wrong with the mother's approach in the next scene? Amy! Now, when we go to your cousins today, I don't want to see any of your normal bad behavior, okay? What? No winding up, no teasing, no running around, no pulling hair, no biting, no kicking, no stealing each other's toys, and especially no shouting, okay? No bad behavior. Oh, Mom, leave me alone. Don't you take that tone with me. This mother has got into the trap of phrasing her instructions negatively and using far too many don'ts. Now watch the scene repeated when the mother is more positive. What do you think makes the difference? Oh, Amy! 
Yeah. Now, when we go to your cousin's today, I want everything to go well. I want everybody to get along. Okay. Now, she's your only cousin, so I'd like you two to play a bit better together. Well, I don't like playing games with her. She always tries to win and she never lets me win. Okay. Well, what could you play together then? Well, um, I don't mind sharing my art set. That's good. We have the art set in the car. So why don't you paint a picture together when we get there? Okay. Okay, let's go. In the repeated scene, the mother clearly tells her daughter what she wants to happen, playing well with her cousin. She then helps her think about how to play with her cousin. This is a much more positive approach. Before you go into school, I used to say, now Brian, you better behave yourself in here and don't be doing this and don't be doing that. Again, it was negative. So I decided to try and turn that around a little bit. And before we'd go, go into the supermarket and brush every time you do a supermarket without the treat. Telling children what they can do. It's very easy to get caught into the trap of just noticing when your children are misbehaving and telling them what you don't want them to do. But if you want to teach them how to behave well, you need to tell them what you want instead. Don't just tell them what they can't do, make sure you tell them what they can do instead. Watch this happen in the next Can do is using a when then instruction. Watch how the mother does this in the next scene. Yeah, let's play the game. Children? Let's play the game. Maria? No, I don't know. Please don't turn that telly on. Now, listen, everybody listen to me. Let's try and get on the level four and boom. Excuse yeah. me. No, no, can you listen to me, please? Now, first of all, you tidy up, put all your books away, and then you can watch the telly. Wow. Um, nicely. Good children. Please. No, Maria. I'll tidy up after. No, you have to tidy up now. Turn. No, no chance. Just my books one. You can see it face. Good children. Well done. This mother is very definite and clear with her children about what she wants. They can watch TV when they've tidied up their homework. I started saying things like, Brian, when you finish playing with your toys, then you can play with your video, or then you can go out and play with your ball or play with your bike. And it was just amazing how he cooperated. Um, Lots of lots of different ways. Every in every single situation that we've asked them to, whether it's bath and um, bed, like when you finish this, then you can do that. Works all the time. It's the one consistent thing that everybody has noticed. The best way to ask children to do something. The way you talk to children when you ask them to do something is as important as what you're asking them to do. Your tone of voice is absolutely crucial in this regard. Above all, you must not get angry and, and must instead be calm. It's important to have a sort of an air of authority in your voice to be definite and to gently insist your child does what you ask. What is the problem with how the mother is asking her son to pick up his coat in the next scene? Look at the state of this place. Brian, will you put away your coat? You left it on the floor. Yeah, yeah, in a minute. Come on, please. It's not fair that you leave yourself lying around the place. You're a selfish boy. Just relax, Mum. I have to do everything myself. In the last scene, the mother is too passive. She lets her son refuse and be rude and does not insist on the coat being picked up. Now watch the scene repeated, where the mother uses a different but equally ineffective approach. What is the problem this time? Look at the state of this place. Brian, pick up your coat now. In a minute, I'm playing my PSP. You pick it up now, this minute. Hmm, no way, I'm playing my PSP. You pick it up now or else. Or else what? Or put it in the bin. Well, go on then. You selfish, selfish boy. This time the mother's tone of voice is angry and she gets a defensive reaction from her son. This leads to her using the threat of putting the coat in the bin which she probably can't carry out. Using an assertive tone of voice. Now watch the last scene repeated, where the mother uses a more effective, assertive approach. Ryan, can you put away your coat, please? You left it on the floor. In a minute, Mum. Ryan, look at me. I want you to put it away now, please. I'm playing the PSP. 
you play your PSP after you put away your coat. Oh, all right. Thanks, love. In the last scene, the mother is assertive with her son. Note how she, one, got her son's attention using his name and making eye contact. Two, gave a polite, clear request. Three, gave her son time to respond. What I found to be very useful was the being calm. Well, for me, which uh, it was the trying to keep a low tone and trying to talk slowly, because when I get agitated or cross or stressed, I go up, um, my, you know, my, 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 I go up an octave and I go up a couple of decibels. And what I've seen is that since I started to be, you know, since first class where I started to just try and keep my voice down and keep really calm, I could see the effect that when I didn't do that, was very obvious the effect it had. Showing your child how to communicate. Even if your child becomes angry or aggressive, it's very important for you to remain calm. Never get upset or angry back. Remember, you want to show your child how to communicate respectfully. In the next scene, the child becomes angry. What do you think of the parents from the bus? Let me help you find him. Oh, come on. Where are they? I don't know where they are. You have to find them. I am not late. I am trying to find them. Oh, Dad, where did you move from? Where did I move them? It's terrible. You're always living down the You're so tired. Where are you going, my son? For God's sake. You know that? See, the child is coming. In return, the father is actually encouraging his daughter's disrespectful communication. Now watch this scene repeated, where the father remains calm and shows his daughter how to communicate. I can only help you if you ask me to Oh, come on, come on, man, hurry! Okay, where are my runners? Yeah, Carrie, the video is lagging, so I couldn't hear. Oh, we can't hear you? If you uh, unmute yourself. Can't hear you still. But thanks, parents, for the conversation and the chat box. Let's continue to ask questions and we can address later. Yeah, Kerry. Okay. Well, it's okay. Well, I can I can stop there. But because we're we're kind of like thinking about the uh, I'm gonna just go back to sharing my PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, and I think what what is uh you know important for us to uh, keep in mind is about how. Uh, you know, we, what kind of patterns have we, uh, you know, been training up at home? And I think the way that we have been able to see the patterns that are, you know, if the pattern right now is a negative pattern, then I think what is really necessary is for us to do some uh, repair work. Okay, in that sense. So um, are you all able to hear me now? Is that okay? Can you hear me? Are you all able to hear me? It's okay? Yeah, can we can. Okay, all right. So um, yeah, so maybe it's important to take a moment just to review for yourself, right? Um, what is the level of your communication with your child today? And then when it comes to rules, right, how clear are your children about what is expected? Then, of course, how are you able to be assertive without escalating into anger outbursts uh, with your child? Uh, because that, what you don't want is an escalation that kind of come, just keeps, uh, you know, leading into a negative cycle, okay? Um, but then, so... You know, we cannot force children to behave or do what we ask, 
right? Um, all we can do is to offer the children, our children a choice between doing what we ask and also a consequence for not doing it. And so we're talking, let, I mean, it's important to just highlight this part about using consequences then to deal with misbehavior, all right? So um, the reason why we want to do this is because um, it will help children learn that there are negative implications to misbehavior. And we also want to, that a result of this in enforcing this is that they can make positive choices for the future. So there are logical consequences and planned consequences, okay? And logical consequences are what happens when they choose to disregard rules or misbehave, okay? So for example, if a child doesn't eat at meal time, then basically they just don't have food until the next meal time. And the child will learn that they need to eat during meal times. If a child stays off school and feigns illness, for example, don't give the child, you know, their PlayStation and enjoy themselves. The, the child actually has to stay in bed for the whole day. And of course, if there's a real illness, I mean, they would be doing that, right? Um, but the whole idea is that if you feel that the child is actually just feigning illness, the child needs to learn that it's not fun to stay away from school. Then if the child comes in an hour late, you know, even though you've already and they already know that they're not supposed to, but they get carried away, of course you can give warnings, right? But if the child does that again, then it's important to enforce consequences where the child will have to go to bed an hour earlier, or there's some privilege that goes, right? Uh, and the important thing is that you learn, the child learns to come in on time. So if a child plays aggressively, playtime ends. And the child learns to play appropriately. Or homework is neglected, no game time for that evening. And the child learns that they have to finish homework before play. But I just want to say a word about this though. Sometimes there's so much homework that, you know, a child finishes their homework only at 11 p.m. in the night. And so, uh, you know, they go to school for six hours, seven hours until two o'clock, they come back and then they have tuition for another four hours. So that's 10 hours. And then they shower and, and then at night is revision or additional, uh, you know, remedial uh, uh, papers to, to, to handle. And it just never ends. And uh, you know, for a child that doesn't get a break at all, that's also uh, quite difficult, isn't it? So um, as much as we want to learn, uh, help the children to learn that they have to finish their homework before play, that work comes before play, there's also a time when all work and no play can also make someone a really dull and unmotivated person. Okay, but this, with that in mind, it's also important to understand that there are planned consequences and also choices that the um, person, I mean, the child can uh, make. So for example, a planned consequence is that you've already thought through, okay, things like time out, time in, losing pocket money, less time for computer games, and so on. And the whole, uh, and you can say, if you don't calm down, if you don't stop raging, you will lose some pocket money. Or if you both continue to fight, then you have to come to my room and stay in my room in silence for 10 minutes, right? Uh, you can also provide choices, but of course, the, if the choice is not to follow the rule, then you have to be ready to enforce the consequence. For example, you can either calm down and take turns, or I will stop the you know, video game, okay? Or you can either play gently with the toys or the toys get put away, right? So uh, similar con uh, idea, right? I, th I think you get it. But how can we make consequences work better, right? So consider these tips, okay? And this is important because, for example, you want to really plan in advance, right? Plan in advance. It's difficult to think in the heat of the moment, okay? So if you just come up with something suddenly, it's, it's, it's going to be seen as really unfair. So again, sit down, think through the consequences, whatever consequences are best, and then work through this together, okay? It must affect the child and not you. So for example, you know, you say, well, um, uh, if you're all gonna be late, then uh, we're not going to uh, visit grandma, but actually, you know, 
I want to visit grandma. So if it affects uh, not the child, but it affects me, then there's not a consequence that actually is effective, right? Um, keep it small, you know, so insist that your child is grounded for a whole day, right? Or you're, gonna, you're not going to have the, the computer or you're not going to get your phone for uh, the whole week. I think that's a bit uh, difficult because it's you, you need to make it because by the next day the child will already be uh, totally you know dysfunctional. So you will end up giving the child back the, the phone or something like that. And a whole week is a really long time. So if you say okay, the whole this evening you will not have your uh, phone games, right? And that might be workable. Or even to say half an hour uh, will be taken out or 20 minutes will be taken out. Because can you imagine if you say one hour uh, is the time that the child gets to play computer games uh, for the day um, with the homework done, okay? But because they misbehave, you take away the whole hour. Then the next day, one misbehavior, they take away the whole hour. So you, you, you're not ex we're not expecting our children to be saints, right? But what we want to do is to give it in small bite sizes so that they are reminded, okay? And within one day, it's possible that they could misbehave two or three times. So can you imagine taking away two days, three days, four days, like I said, a whole week of uh, fun and games, right, for them? Um, that really should is not a very balanced way of uh, working with the consequences. And of course, but uh, um, yeah, so small consequences will give children a chance to behave well again. And also it's easier to implement because if you have a whole week of grounding and you can't implement it, you know, it's not going to be effective again. And of, also, of course, you know, never run out of consequences. So, uh, you know, have a lot of think, brainstorm with your, your husband or wife, right? How many extra consequences can you come up with? How many bite sizes? Um, uh, again, uh, bite sizes. Uh, if you're, you're only giving pocket money $1 a day to your child and you say, you 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 mess up, you're gonna I'm going to take $1 away. I mean, you, you know yourself, we are not going to let our child go without money to school. So uh, uh, if it's five cents being deducted, 10 cents that being deducted, maybe at the end of the day, they still get 80 cents. But, you know, uh, it, it really has to be something that's enforceable, right? Uh, so think about as many consequences as you can and make it small enough so that you do not run out, okay? Uh, then, of course, we want to give a choice. Uh, as we have mentioned earlier, and be respectful. Uh, even though you are saying... Uh, you know, negotiating with the child. You know, come on, I really don't want to do this to you, but I need you to do this so that you can uh, get something done, all right? Uh, and it's the more you enforce it calmly, the better it is, okay? But of course, if misbehavior continues, then it's really important to uh, use extra consequences, right? For example, like every minute that you refuse, to uh, stop, you know, you will have to spend an extra minute doing something else or a chore or, you know, every time you fight, you're going to lose more uh, privileges, um, you know, so, something that will help you to get going, all right? And I think the step-by-step -step plan is, uh, you know, it's really important that, first of all, you don't want to remind children um, of the rules only when... Uh, you know, something happens. Okay, so remind them of the rules early. Uh, but at that point itself, you can still tell them again, re remember what we agreed upon, all right, and then use small consequences, build up slowly, pause so that the child gets a chance to behave, right, and then remain calm so that you do not get escalated and flustered and encourage the child you know, encourage the child, please work together with me, okay? And things will get better, all right? So, so it's uh, um, how consequences can work. And uh, I just want to mention that, you know, when we actually teach our children, uh, you know, and they learn good boundaries, their child is actually having mastery over themselves and then being able to have mastery over what it is like, the family life itself becomes better. 
they also learn how to relate better in community. And even online, these are good boundaries. Uh, and, and again, it's in a whole talk by itself again, right? How to, do you actually even work through the issues regarding uh, the online community right now? But really, your goal is to help your child to become independent and learn interdependence, okay? But I want to just mention also that boundaries are some things that is something that parents also need. How do you know if your own boundaries are blurred, right, with regards to your children and without, with regards to your parenting? So questions like these, right? Are you constantly doing for your child what he can and ought to do for himself, right? Then that might be a little bit hovering over them too much. Are you um, asking them questions, interrogating them over everything? Then it might be a bit over controlling. Or are you allowing your child to become the center or the direction of the whole family? So if the child doesn't do something, nobody sleeps. If the child doesn't uh, feel, feel good, then nobody goes anywhere, right? Including yourself. And uh, then the living tr through your child vicariously, that means they are, when they achieve something, then their, their achievements are yours. And if they are failures, their failures are yours as well. But there has to be a certain separation between you and your child, all right? Because you don't want to fall apart just because your child gets upset uh, or, 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 or that life cannot carry on because your child fails in something, right? As a parent, what's most important is that you also understand how to take care of yourself and individuate between you and your child. You need to take time for your own rest and self-care. You need to make time in your own busy schedule to grow, take care of your own rest, your own physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual needs. You also want to surround yourself with supportive and positive people like the people at Teacher, right? And uh, seek help when needed. You're not alone. You're not alone. And many parents are struggling as well, but there can be encouragement when you're in the group. And know your boundaries, stick to your principles. You don't have to give in just because your child gets upset, right? When you know you're cared for, then you can care much better, right? So when it comes to the whole question about um, rules and technology, screen time and so on, right? Uh, remember, it's really necessary to adopt a gradual approach. Think of a funnel, okay? Um, when they're younger, the best supervision and, uh, you know, to, to be supervised closer and that they do not get all of the privileges. But when they, are get, when they get older, then there is some time of unsupervised, but then you still need to have access to all history, know about their passwords and so on. But when they get uh, you know, access to new technology like social media account and all those things. It's only if you have already thought through it, gone through, uh, you know, safety issues, gone through use issues, time issues, and then learn, uh, you know, um, getting the, 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 the clear about the boundaries and expectations, and then they, that they allow it. But also to have put in all of the, um, what do you call, the consequences that you have as strategies to prevent your child from being over, going overboard, all right? But uh, really Im important to focus on positive goals because the, the, the phone or the computer um, uh, can be something that's uh, also something the children run away to escape from something, right? What is it that they're escaping from? Uh, sometimes it's also a lack of alternatives uh, and family life sometimes again uh, balance think of the balance uh, there needs to be exercise not just mental stimulation homework homework but there's and and when when you talk about the screen time again is a mental uh, and eye kind of a, a stimulation so there's so much a need for a lot more other structures to come in right time to just have conversations, time to have um, uh, things that we can do together, right? Activity, exercise, and then 
um, these are all part and parcel of your uh, safety plan. So you've got to think through the whole issue. And I must tell, must mention that um, uh, Parents Plus also, uh, you know, has quite a few other talks that's coming up um, in June as well uh, for the adolescents, for the early years and for the children's program. And you are welcome to take a picture of this and also to uh, scan and register. If you cannot make it in June, you can also, um, you know, take a picture of this and actually email Karen dot vincent at phylos.sg and she will actually get in touch with you and let you know of some of our upcoming uh, sessions okay so i want to thank you for your participation and i know it's already uh, time to for questions and answer and i know there's a lot of questions and answers on dsa as well so i'm going to end here and uh, stop share okay thank you so much carrie i think a lot of uh, good tips for parents and even myself, you know, so many things I can apply. Okay, so if you're not uh, speaking, do mute yourself, but if you like to ask questions, like you can unmute and just ask verbally. Anyone? At the same time, we can also look at some of the questions uh, from the chat box. I think, Carrie, someone asked about the link uh, again. Ah, okay, so, yeah. Let me yeah, try to get that chat and box. post it in the, let, yeah, let me get that and uh, try to post it in the chat box. Okay. Yeah. And also I think, uh, let's see your email as well. If they want to reach you, right? Okay. Uh, I'll yes. just put it, I'll just put it in there. Yeah. And then uh, earlier on also someone um, is asking a few questions. Okay. Uh, let me try to get that. Um, so the information, oh, the slide on parenting funnel. <laughs> okay, so it looks like parenting I Parenting funnel slide, is it? Uh, okay, wait a minute. Let me just go to the funnel. So, Carrie, maybe we can address some of the questions. Do you want to go yeah, just sure. one at a time? Uh, okay. Um, you can you ask it so that I because I I can't yeah. be looking at the chat group <laughs> at this. Can group. can so I'll just try to sum up a few and try to put them together. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, okay, but we can always go by the the. Yeah, the, I must say that uh, the, there are not questions too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's okay. We can also do the DSA maybe after yeah. uh, this segment on the, the parenting mm. part. Okay, so yeah, here's the parenting worry. funnel. Yeah, but uh, you have the questions. Yes. So one question. Hold on. Uh, let me scroll. Oh wait, someone asked about the workshop as well. A oh. different workshop. Will it be also in Philo's sure. uh, website? Uh, yes, it is. Course. It is. Yes. You can actually go to phylos.sg and just uh, uh, sign up. Okay. phylos.sg is F-I-L-O-S dot, dot S-G. S-G. Yes. Yeah. So it's on the okay. web. Yeah. Okay. I'll ask these questions um, and also it's a comment, you know, allowing kids to fail, get hurt. Would this be, sometimes this works better than countless reminders. You know, of course, if this happens, then parents we need to let go, and we can also do so weighing out the consequences. So this is a comment by Kayla, yeah. and then uh, support we are fill up, and then we can lead the kids much better, much better. Because you mentioned in the slide that we should take care of ourselves first. Yeah. So um, uh, you know. I think I think that uh, we have a very uh, I mean that this is a, a this is a bit of a culture in Singapore. It's like we have no room for failure, hmm. you know. Uh, and I think that's the bit of a, this is tough. It's tough, okay. Uh, and I think for, uh, parents feel it too, you know, because we grow up in the system, 
And, uh, you know, you, even as a parent, come on, none of us want to have a, uh, be a parent that fails, right? Uh, in the same way, we also wish that all our children are the ones that, you know, make it to be doctors and 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 and, and lawyers, and then you know they all they all have uh, great good grades and all that. But when we when we when we actually, but you know what? For children, when they actually fail and they have someone that can encourage them and coach them and and, and give them a sense of what happened, uh, help them integrate uh, how they can do it better. Uh, give them the patience to try again. I tell you, their learning is their, their learning is lifelong. Their learning and the impact of that mistake itself, uh, you know, goes much further. Right when you do it for them and they never fail, right? right. Uh, actually, it that's the problem where many of our young people today, and I see some of them, uh, they really don't know how to take failure. And they are so uh, fragile. Yeah. Right. I mean, just to use the word fragile is a very hard pain, huh? right? But yeah. I think that sometimes parents are trying so hard to just form a protection around our children so that they never fail. But that actually um, doesn't help them to be resilient. Right. Okay, early on, Samantha asked, uh, melting out consequences, uh, what if they don't comply? What else can she do? I think there's a parent, Namrata, also mentioned that grounding rules never seems to work for them. He mm -hmm. finds that it defeats the purpose. She'd rather let them take so, a moment so, to reflect. So you, remember, you remember the part of the video where the, the, the mother comes in and she just shouts, Calls the son and say, you, you're caught and you're not picking it up. And then, you know, you see, you see what you do to me. Uh, and then after the child says, oh, I don't care. Right. And then the, she picks up the child, the coat. She picks up the coat and then she walks off and she's upset about it. All right. And I think that, yes, we ha can uh, come to a point where uh, we really don't know what to do. Right. Uh, so, and at that point itself, we might not be able to address something. But I think it is never too late to actually bring uh, our children back to a, a conversation, right? About um, how we are actually not happy about what's going on and how actually um, it's affecting our relationships, it's affecting his competency, his growth, or even our family relationships, right? And I think this is an important conversation to have. But the more we avoid that conversation and the more we, uh, so okay, so it's like, you know, we say uh, in, 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 in Chinese, uh, so luan, uh, and then so ing, uh, you know, we try to be soft, we try to be hard. We, we, we have to do the whole works. But up to a certain point, we have to allow consequences to happen. All right? So really, uh, you know, and if the consequences is that they fail, then they mm. have to, yeah, they have to face it. And yet, does parenting stop there? Yep. Parenting doesn't stop there. Because it's when they face the consequence and they get frustrated, we do not condemn them. We are here to say, what, what do you see? What do you learn? What, what happened? Right? And, and I think one of the uh, most important questions that we need to ask ourselves is this. When our child fails, right, and and it's because we actually did not have the, the so-called the grit to carry out earlier con consequences. And we just allowed them uh, to dirty their room, to fail, to don't do their homework, to ignore us. I think actually at the end of the day, we're going to feel guilty. We're going to feel more guilty than the child. And sometimes it's the guilt mm. that actually will keep us even more fearful of engaging with our child. And I think maybe that honest conversation is needed also. That one day I pick my child, my son or my daughter and I say, you know, I think I have done, I, I've been wrong also. And mm. I realized that, you know, I wasn't firm enough with you. But I think that, you know, your failure is not just about yourself but we need to do something about this, right? And I think mom wants to be a different mom today. 
Yeah, I think you also answer to why. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, I think a bit unstable, the internet, too many people are using okay. <laughs> in the whole of Singapore. Okay. okay, why mention that yeah, this generation of kids may not accept rules easily? If they implement and force rules, what if it affects their emotional health and then push them over the edge? Um, mm -hmm. Another one, Lim, Mr. Uh, is it MC, my child, P6, doesn't care about rules, agreed rules, always push the line. He likes screen time, but using it as a reward on consequences doesn't make him cooperative. Now with home-based learning, he's doing a lot of gaming, YouTube, instead of online assignment. Uh, yeah. You can't stay right beside him all the time. Yeah, that's true, isn't it? Um, yeah, so let me let me just end the slideshow. Um, yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, you know, Rules is, yeah, rules are rules, uh -huh. um, but I think that uh, sometimes we forget that actually the relationship is very important, All right? So if you have a, you know, if you work on that relationship with your child, um, uh, it really helps um, you to, um, be able to, like I said, have the hard conversations. And the hard conversations are not always uh, about, you know, how much you have failed. Uh, it is about uh, how much you mean to me, <laughs> okay? Uh, I must say that, you know, if you have rules, but there is, uh, and this comes from Josh Madawo, who is, uh, uh, you know, I think really done a lot of good work. It says rules without relationships lead to rebellion. Okay. Um, but truth without relationship also can lead to a lot of rejection. But it's, if, if there's discipline and then again without relationship, that also can lead to a lot of anger. So let me maybe um, let me just share this particular uh, slide with you. Okay. Um, And, and maybe I'll, yeah, I'll just end with this particular um, slide. Yes, parents, you're mindful of time. So you really need yeah. to go with your kids okay. to bed. Right. Uh, please do. Yep. Okay. So this is the last slide. And uh, I think I'll end with this. I think relationship is really yep. most important. So if you have a relationship with your child, your child knows how much you love them and you care for them, how much you want for them to be successful, how much you also understand how difficult life is. <laughs> yeah, it's not easy to be a, a child in uh, 2021. Uh. Uh, it's, it may be easier. Those days are gone when we can just like uh, play marble and then catch spider and then, you know, do a lot of things because our parents don't care about us <laughs> or rather the, we don't have to study so much. Okay, but really... Uh, you really need that relationship, okay? It's when you discipline, 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 or you score, 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 or you give one rule after another, and there's no relationship, right? And you don't spend enough time to understand their world and their issues. Then it will lead to more rebellion, more rejection, more anger. But when you, you work, go through life and difficulties with them, they respect you. Uh, you know, they, they will do, they will do. And even if it's late, nah? even if they study, didn't do that well now, but I tell you later on, they, they will pick up man. They will, th there is always that pick up and that re, you know, kind of a re return, return to, uh, you know, good uh, uh, functionality. And more importantly is this is your son. This is your daughter, right? And they, they love you and you love them. Okay, over back to you, uh, Andrew. Okay, thank you, Carrie. We're going to uh, end officially, but if you have any other questions uh, after we end, especially for DSA, I'll still be around. But I just want to thank Carrie again and also Karen from Phylos. 
And just one request before we, we go for those who need to, and if you're still interested to remain behind to talk about DSA, I'll be here for as long as you want. <laughs> Definitely not past midnight, but we're going to end the session officially. Um, can I request that you turn on your camera so that we can take a photo? You know, it's really will be very good for, you know, memory. <laughs> and uh, we can, you know, just, just be nice to see you before you leave. Um, yeah, for the rest of the parents, if you are really not comfortable and you really need to go because we have uh, passed the time, uh, please do. Okay, thank you so much. I can see so many parents and a few friends and teacher online parents. Thank you so much. Okay, are we ready to just take one or two screenshots because I think there are uh, nearly a hundred of us. Some have left. Thank you, Surinder, Kathleen, Sudo. Oh, I can't name everybody, just too many. Joey, okay, we, I think um, we, are, we are ready. <laughs> I don't think we need any hand signs. But... Okay, ready? One, two, three. Okay, go to the next page. But the next page, <laughs> Jenny, Kayla, and a few others. I can see, but very few, but we will take a photo. Ready? One, two, and three, Sherry, the third page, nobody. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, my back-end team, teacher online team. Thank you for making this possible. So thank you, Kerry. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. And, and good night for those who need to go. But if you really want to stay uh, behind, um, definitely I'm going to stay with you talk about DSA, okay? Anything about DSA as far as I can help and answer you. Okay, thank you and good night. You can start to go, but yeah, feel free to stay. Thank you so much. Okay, so parents, for those who are still behind, hold on. Uh, I just reckon that uh, you have uh, DSA questions. You know, because I understand this is also something you might be grappling with. So you can actually unmute yourself and we can start a conversation. Or if you do not mind, um, I'm not too sure. I think your kids will be at home not sleeping right now. <laughs> Tomorrow is HPL. Yeah, but HPL has to wake up early and report your temperature and all that. But if you're not in the rush, I will actually uh, uh, try and, you know, just go through a few of my slides. And then I can go back to the questions that you were asking uh, earlier on. Is that okay? okay? Try to mute yourself if you if you are not speaking yet. Okay, let's see. Okay, now uh, can you see my slides? Oh, okay. Because earlier on there were some issues. Yeah, you can, you can see. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Sanji. Yeah, Paris, you can, we can have a conversation uh, very soon if you want to admit yourself. Okay, I think in regards to DSA, right, as a father and also as a former educator in MOE, and even right now as an educator, uh, I would definitely uh, advise uh, be always present in this journey. Speak to your <coughs> kids a lot. You know, take him to different schools when, you know, maybe not during the HBL or try to find out more about the school that you want him or her to get into or the school he or she wants to get into. So always be emotionally uh, present, <clears throat> mentally supportive and definitely try not to impose your will on your kid. Right? And then of course, celebrate the effort and the PSI comes and go. There can go into this school, study or no tuition, and then still can get an A1, AL1. Okay, so never compare. This is something that uh, we should not do. Okay, so DSA choosing a secondary school, right? Is it a parent's choice or a child's choice? So I think my advice is um, be very careful because sometimes it can be very subtle. 
you know, because of the, uh, the, the pride, the face and whatnot. Some parents uh, actually struggle with this because we want to be seen successful if a child goes to such and such a school. So that when, when friends or relatives, you know, ask about, if we school your child is, uh, you wouldn't want to say uh, uh, ulu ulu something something secondary school. You know, so sometimes um, unknowingly, we are actually trying to look good ourselves. You know, and uh, sometimes that can sort of like mask and blind us, you know, in terms of giving advice or pushing our kids to a certain kind of school that has certain names. So I think um, we have to be very careful, you know, that we are not trying to impose our will on our, on our children, right? So it should be a discussion. It should be something that they, both of you come together. Okay, let's try for DSA, for the school, this school. And actually there's no harm in applying for DSA, you know, just trying out, but yet not imposing and say, you, you have to get it, you have to get it get him or her to all the causes, interview causes, and you pay a large sum of money. And then uh, the more you get involved and the more you are emotionally attached to that DSA or that school, and then if you don't get it, then of course, you're going to face a lot more issues. Okay? So take it in G's and say, hey, Jonathan, why don't you just try it out? Or, or, or uh, Samantha or you know, your child's name. Say, just go for it, no harm, you know. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, then no worries about it. You know what I mean? Okay, so uh, take it as an exercise, take it as an option. Okay, so just want to share with uh, parents here that it's very important to involve them in the decision-making, do respect. But yeah, at the same time, of course, they are young, you know, you also want to give certain advice. Uh, at this point, maybe they re can't really make a uh, good choice sometimes. Um, so I think it is a balance, you know, have a talk so that he or she also feels good when he or she applies for the DSA, like one or three schools and say, yeah, I think it's something that I, I, I just want to try it out. Because um, uh, we do have parents that I've heard of, you know, direct testimony, um, especially from two parents, because recently we had a DSA talk as well by SG families. And they mentioned their children actually not really, really want to go for SOTA, you know, the, I think it's a creative arts kind of a DSA. But the parents noticed that um, their children, the, these two children are really good in the art, you know, the drawing and, and whatnot. And so after much persuasion, they say, just try, there's no harm, you know. And the kids, I say, yeah, why not? And uh, both of them actually got in because I think they have some innate uh, talent in terms of like drawing, shading, painting. And uh, yeah, they got to enjoy uh, the schools, right? So sometimes it's a bit of nudging and all that. I think um, that is still quite healthy, right? Not like, just go, just go for it. And even the child say, no, I don't really like that school because da, 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 da. And I say, no, just go for it. You know, I give you a choice, but just go for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, giving you a choice, but just go for it. You know, so sometimes we can be like contradictory, right? So, um, yeah, do it as a win-win situation. Okay, so in uh, choosing to DSA or not, or which school, um, consider whether the school is suitable. Um, my son is actually in an IP school. Uh, um, so from what I hear from the story and also actually my friends are the principal of these IP schools, uh, I, I do hear stories of students who go into this school via sports, but the, uh, the, their grades are around 210, you know, a, a previous T score, past the expressive stream, not possible to go by academic ability, you know, but got in by the DSA, uh, uh, CCA sports, but not really named the sports. Uh. Okay, because the school is also trying to build up uh, the sports, you know, in terms of the trophies, in terms of the recognitions, you know. So a few years back, they got a number of students to get into this particular uh, IP school, a JC, and uh, uh, take in primary school students who are very good in the sports at 2-0 something, 2-10, 
actually they got into a school that has a T-score of 250, 260. So you can imagine they struggle a lot. You know, they are there to play basketball, give, bring honors, honor to the, to the school. Of course, the school tries to help them, but they keep failing. And it's really very uh, difficult for these students. You know, so do see whether, um, you know, are your children suitable for these, uh, for these schools? Okay, and then of course, look at the program, the CCA. Um, so if your child is very good in Chinese orchestra, you know, there are not many schools that have Chinese orchestra. So it depends, you know, uh, rather you want to go to a brand name school but doesn't have this Chinese orchestra. Let's say for example, RGS and, and uh, some other schools are that, you know, or you want to go to a, a neighborhood school that consistently perform really well in either Chinese dance or some, a lot of many schools, they do not have Chinese dance. You know, so look at the program, look at the CCA. If that school has that program and they are doing really well, you know, maybe it's better to send them to these uh, not so branded school. But he or she gets to enjoy and develop the talent uh, much further. Okay, then of course, uh, school culture uh, has to do with school program, right? Because the school culture affects what kind of school program they, they have. Right, so if your, your child is not very into Chinese, for example, you know, so if you get into a SAP school like Dunman High and all that, you find that your child is struggling. You know, it's going to be quite difficult, you know, not very Chinese and, 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 and you, you, you just not really very suitable, right? And of course, the last one and uh, among all, I think there are many other factors. Now. Distant, traveling time, um, now with COVID, not too sure one, two years from now, I'm sure things will get better. Yeah, but it does affect, um, you know, the sleeping duration, like five hours sleep or eight hours sleep. You know, so it depends uh, whether you wake up so, so much earlier and the traveling time is more than an hour and, you know, to and fro, it'd be two hours, two and a half hours. And it's going to be very tiring for your kids. Okay, then um, O-level track. Okay, I hope all these are applicable to you, but I'll try to go a bit faster so we can uh, answer some of the questions. And if some parents are here, you can help me out. You have gone through it. You can also help to answer. I can't really see the chat box right now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, y'all can hear me, right? Okay, do stop me if you if you can't. Huh? Okay, so for all level try, I think everyone knows, right, about all level from now to uh, set one, set four, and then set five, right? Whether you you clear and then you go to JC, Poly, ITE, or you go to work or you go to army. Um, what else about all levels? Mm, subject bending, maybe I can talk a little bit more later on. There's a SBB. I think it's in one of my slides. Okay, so O level, you can choose the express, normal acad, normal tech, and you can actually cross stream. You're not doing well express, you can, so to speak, drop down to NANT. If you're good in NA, you can go to express, NT, you can go to NA. And you also can, as an NA, take an express subject. That's actually the SBB. Okay, IP program is actually, like I mentioned earlier, TJC, NJC. They're actually a JC, just that now they have set one, set two, set three, set four students. And they don't, they don't take the O-levels. Uh, so if they fail the A-levels, they only got PSLE. <laughs> and the Chinese O-level, right? They will take actually Chinese at O-level at year four. Okay, so IP program is uh, rather broad because they are not really preparing for O-level. Although I must say that increasingly, or they do try to follow somewhat the syllabus because some, some schools in the IP school has a class uh, that will take the O level. Okay, um, actually it's quite sad because any students in the IP school that takes O level, uh, it actually me means that he or she is not doing well. Okay, so he has to go to this class, something like a last class and they'll actually prepare them to take O level if that school has an O level class. But many of these schools uh, will not have, so it means that they have to be transferred out to a neighborhood school. 
So sorry, please mute yourself or turn you can help me to mute if any parent is uh, unmuted and has background noise. Okay, so um, yeah, anything about IP school, because my son is in IP school, my friends are principal and vice principal in IP schools, so, uh, you can always ask me later on. Okay, let me move on. Oh, I'm taking quite a bit of time. Right? Okay, so subject based spending, I think I've heard in, in the newspaper and the ministry, right? If you get a good score at um, PSRE, even if your child is in NA, you can actually uh, go to and take express uh, subject at SET1. So if your child is NA in SET1 or NT, the NT student can take the subject at NA level. So in at SET1, sorry parents, please mute yourself. Alton, can you help me? Uh, mute parents who, who have background mute sound, noise. Okay, so I think, um, you know, because even if you're an NA child, a student, can be extremely good at math, you know. So in the past, without the SVB, right, the child has to take like, and in math or all that few years. But now at set one, actually you can take all subjects. Uh, Andrew, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. I was kicked out and now I'm back. I think you, the parents are thinking that maybe I left earlier. <laughs> okay. But thanks. Thank you, parents, so much for staying uh, behind. Uh, again, uh, if you need to go, please do. Okay. Um, uh, other slides? Informative? Actually, I've not finished the slides. Uh, shall I go on? Or do we want to go to Q&A? Let me see. Lagging too. <clears throat> okay, are you okay if I continue with my few last few slides? Then we can have a very open conversation. Wait, someone is saying something. Uh, maybe my time is time limit. Okay, not too sure. Okay, kindly continue. Can I just one parent give me the permission? I'll just continue again. Okay. Where was I? Okay, so the so you have to look at the school's uh, CCA program. Uh, do go and visit the MOE website and the school website that you're interested. I'm very, very sure during this period, the school would have put up, you know, the area that you can actually DSA your kid, you know, and apply. Okay, so do go to the individual school website and then look at the, the, the that particular page or link. If you're not too sure, you can call the school up. Okay, because different schools, they will offer different uh, uh, DSA uh, area. All right, so do, do note that. It is very important because in the secondary school life, uh, it is about 1,500, 600, 700 days. So make an informed choice, DSA or not. Once you get into the school, give all that you can to support your child you know, to move it forward. Um, at the end of the day is, you know, um, again, all schools are good school. It's really good enough to, you know, propel your child. And really more important is to be able for your child to develop the, the hard work, the discipline, you know, to be able to do well um, and then get a good, enough grade and then there's really more to life than DSA there's definitely more to life to PSLE you know look at the the child look at his character look at his attitude these are the things that will take him a really fine life uh, not necessarily top school top top school brand name schools 
Okay, if you have not seen or have not heard, uh, many students in this school suffer a lot of stress. <laughs> see doctors, see psychiatrists, see psychologists, you know, because of the stress, because of the competition. So it's really about small fish in big pond, big fish in small pond. Uh, no, no straight answer, really. There's no straight answer. You know, so really um, take it in a very open mind. You know, or you try to get them to like good schools, brand, better brand name school, but yet at the same time be very open that it's not a do or die, right? Just try and then no, it doesn't happen. You know, whichever school that he or she is assigned to, just say, hey, let's go and you know, let's let's be happy. Let's go to this school, visit the school, take a look. Okay, but I understand during this period is whether do you want to DSA or not. I think there's no harm to try it out. You know, go for an interview, send in the application. Uh, better to try and then not even call for interview. Then you don't even try and submit any application. All right? So go through the exercise as a, as a chance to develop good relationship with your boy or girl. And then discuss, hey, then what do you think? You know, uh, your, well, the child's name of Daniel. My, my child's P5 is Daniel. Hey, Daniel, you're on the DSA. Now. Which school do you like? What kind of sports? And all that. Okay, so keep it very open and then relax even if you are not called up for interview. Okay, so what can you do as a parent to, to help him or her in this DSA journey, uh, whether you DSA or not, or this PSRE journey or this secondary school journey? Um, the number one thing is it's not really about DSA or going to like top, top schools. It's really about your child's uh, principles and values. Okay, so never let this goal, right? Day in, day out, establish that principle. And the best way is to lead by example. Children see, children do. It's not, don't do what I do, huh? You know, let's say you, you do something not so nice, you know. So it's always uh, demonstrate and lead by examples. And this is really very important, right? To establish the principles and the value. Yeah, definitely better than if you do everything you can and then without the character you go to a, a brand name school but so what right okay so value and uh, integrity and, and and whatnot is really important okay this is one book but it's a bit commercial type he, he writes principles for his uh, company but this guy really go after principles right so he write them down and the second one is uh, reflection right in whatever we do um you know, sit down with our child, like, you know, talk about it, uh, like a buddy, like a friend, like a mentor, like a good parent, you know, and then, hey, what happened? You, you did well. Okay, what do you do that led to this? So reflection is very key, okay, to learn from the experience. Okay, so we don't just um, learn uh, from experience. We also learn from reflecting, talking about it, writing it down. You know, talk about uh, success and failures. You know, why do you fail? Why do you pass? Why do you do well? Why do you not do well? Okay, so essay one, results, are they out? <laughs> Let me check. check the chat box. Any, anyone? Essay, yes, Kayla. <laughs> okay, are the results out? Happy, disappointed, partially? <laughs> no, not yet. Some no exams. But school cleverly have a lot of tests and call them weighted assessments. It's like, oh my goodness, you know. <laughs> so it's actually mini exams. La. And then what is weighted assessment and non-weighted assessment? It's just weird. COVID <laughs> reflection, just one subject review. Okay, so I think this is a time not to be judgmental, but rather sit down and uh, reflect on the experience. Okay, you got 51, you just passed what happened, you know, talk about it and not impose judgment. It's like you make a judgment already. You know, you, you pass a judgment, sorry. You know, and say, it's terrible. It's just terrible. You know, so when the result comes out, especially if it's not good or not good enough, you know, we pass a judgment. You didn't study, you were lazy. See, I told you. So you immediately pass a judgment. So I think be very careful about that. Okay, you, it's better to talk and ask, um, are you happy with your results? What do you think? You know, what gone wrong, what gone right? You know, could you have done it better rather than you pass a judgment? You know, always do questioning, you know, 
uh, what were you aiming before? You know, are you happy? If you're happy, why? If you're not happy, why? Okay, so I think that's important. I think I some, oh yeah, Borton's uh, way, uh, very simple, right? This academics, just write papers and research papers, but actually it's quite simple. <laughs> okay, so just talk about what, what happened. Okay, you, you, you scored 90 of 100, this is what actually happened, right? Or you failed 20 of 100. I have a parent who called me the other day, 20 of 100. Okay, so what happened? So, so this is what happened, 20 of 100, 90 of 100. Okay, so now go to the next. So actually what actually happened that led to you getting 90? Oh, I was consistently putting hard work. I was doing this, I listened in class. Uh, could you have gotten a bit more? So yes, I actually made a few mistakes. Okay, so that's the so what part. So what, go into critical thinking, go deep into it, you know, reflect. Uh, if you score about 20 upon 100, what happened? You know, what happened? You know, uh, so talk about it. You don't have the aptitude, you are not doing your homework consistently. Get the child to answer. Try to apply the eight second rule. Okay, because many times when we ask our kid question, we answer for them or we score them before you answer. <laughs> right, you know what happened? Because you, you, know, you have not even given him or her time to think and to answer. So there's actually a, a, this eight second rule, right? Think through, write it down, you know, let the child process the thoughts. Then the last one would be now what? What, is, what can be done now? You know, so uh, Jonathan, uh, whatever, Daniel, my son, Daniel, you know, so now this happened, you failed, you didn't do as well. Then you talk about, so what? Because you wouldn't consistent in your work, blah, 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 blah. And the very important one is now what? Okay, what are you going to do? Let the child speak, write it down and to commit. Okay, and not to just impose whatever you as a parent want him or her to do. Okay, last one, I think, for this particular part. This advice, focus on learning yourself and, and your child. That's very, very important. So I think earlier on, um, I did put in the, the chat box that in order to be a good parent and to bring positive energy and love to your child, it's very important first um, yourself. Know what you're struggling with. Sometimes it can be jobs, sometimes it can be relationships, sometimes it could be with your spouse. So I think the most important is to make sure that you have time to, for yourself to grow, to learn, to, you know, to even deposit positivity uh, uh, and, and, you know, and the mindset and the heart. You know, take a break yourself, go for a walk. You know, if you're facing issues, try to get help, you know, so that you can actually cope and grow uh, yourself as an individual, and then you can impact your spouse. And
Uh, hi everyone. So sorry. Uh, Andrew's connection got uh disconnected again. He's trying to connect back right now. Yeah. So once he's back, uh, you continue his presentation. Hi, I'm back and Terence are still around. <laughs> so amazing. 40 year plus, 40 of you. Yeah, I'm very, very, very sorry. I don't know what happened. And, and, uh, and you're still here, amazing. You're okay, huh? Please feel free to go anytime. I feel so bad. So sorry. So um, I'm almost done ready. So yeah, hold your hand now so that they can hold yours when you grow old. You spend time with them now, they'll spend time with you later on. If you don't spend time with them right now, don't love them right now, they will not do so when we get old. Okay, so this is very, very... Keep a journal. I would definitely recommend you to write a journal. Write all your frustration as a parent, as a, an adult. You bring a lot of healing to yourself. And also write your personal like prayer for your child. Say, hey, uh, Daniel, da, 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 da. You know, I really hope that he will be a very successful person. He will marry well. He will do this. He will do that. It's very therapeutic. For all my four kids, I do have four prayer journals for every one of them, you know, and, and I do keep them. And now when they grow older, right, I actually duck it up, you know, like 10 years ago journal. When I pray for Elizabeth, Judah, Abigail and Daniel, and I actually showed to two of my kids. And they were, I think they were very, very surprised. They didn't, didn't say anything, but they saw their names on every page. You know, can you imagine on every, every page, of this book, you know, Elizabeth, you will grow beautiful. You will have a beautiful, wonderful husband. You know, uh, today you are sick. You know, I, I pray that you will be well. Then after that, Judah. Judah has another prayer journal. Dear Judah, sometimes he's talking to him. Sometimes he's talking to God. Sometimes he's talking to myself. <laughs> you know, Judah, you will be a man of integrity. You will bless the world when you grow up. You will be protected you know, from, from uh, all these blah, blah, blah. So, you know what I mean? You know, then my wife also have a journal. In fact, got a lot of journal <laughs> pure writing. You know, because there was once, she actually um, went through a very difficult time with the third and the fourth kid. And every day I was writing it. I would say that it's every day for that period of time, you know, that Jessica, you will be healed. You know, the baby will be all right. Da, 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 every single day. Now I kept it, it's, it's beautiful, it's priceless, you know. Okay, then I kept one for myself, you know. Andrew, today I'm very down, I'm going to push myself. Da, da, da. I just write, you know, and write to myself. Super powerful and it's super precious now. Okay, these books. Okay, I'm done already. This is my email and my handphone number. So if you need to, you know, let's say we don't have enough time, now it's already 10.20. Uh, but definitely, I'm willing to stay for as long as uh, I need to. Okay, so uh, you can take a screenshot. You can take down my number. If we, I can't answer the question right now and you find that maybe I can help you a bit more, uh, you can always message me, talk. We can't have a coffee, but you certainly can have a Zoom conversation. Okay, so let me stop share now and see the question box. Anyone wants to unmute and... Ask me question. Okay, good night. Good night, killer. Yeah. Uh, those who want to stay or uh, uh, stay, those who need to go, please go. It's already 10 20. But I'll just look through the question. Welcome, Mrs. Slim, Jane. Wait, how do I scroll up right now? Uh, Tony, I can't scroll up. Thank you, Cheryl. Wait, uh. oh, no, I can. I think much, much earlier, there are a lot of questions also. Okay. 
I can't screw. Oh, I know why. I can't screw up because I left and then I came back again. So sorry. Maybe those who are around, I'm sure there must be something why you are still here. So either you type the questions again. I have lost all the previous questions. Or you can just unmute and we can just talk it out. Yeah, thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, June. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, anyone wants to ask me anything, you can unmute. Maybe some parents are not here any longer, but their Zoom is still here. They fell asleep already for Carrie, but there was not answered. Okay. Yeah, anyone would like to unmute yourself? Do you do counseling? Yes, someone asked me. Yes, my wife as well, we can do for free. Uh, if you need any help counseling or someone to talk to, yeah, you can do it. Hey, Joey, you have anything to ask me? Hello, thank you for turning on your camera. <laughs> Some parents may be left ready, but they can their, their Zoom accounts. No, things to note when preparing for a child for DSA. Okay, first, of course, you need to apply for DSA, right? After you apply for DSA, uh, uh, that three schools, you know, see whether you can even get the chance to go for the interview, right? I think the interview is end June, July, something like that. I think I'll hold another session, how to ace the interview, how to prepare for interview. But of course, first is now you need to apply. And I would encourage, you know, why not just try? No harm, right? You don't get all, any interview and get any like pass, so to speak, to go for your round of interview. Then so be it. But if your child gets in the interview, then we can have another conversation, right? What to prepare, how to prepare. And certainly you need confidence. You need to prepare some questions. But I don't think you need to spend a lot of money. You know? I know there are some money-making companies, you know. But you need a lot of money, a lot of many, many sessions, you know. I'm not too sure. Like, I'm really not into like, money-making kind. Like. I'll just give you for free. Like, you know, whole uh, two, three sessions, how to ace the interview for free. <laughs> don't, make, don't, don't lose any money just because of that. You know, spend expensive. I know some... Sp Centers they try to monetize it, but I, I will not do that. Okay, so certainly confidence, I can give you like uh, the questions that normally they ask from top school, from neighborhood schools. Yeah, I, I do, I have led uh, as a vice principal. I, I led the panelists and the DSA uh, for my school. So I will know like roughly what kind of questions, what kind of things you look out for, you know, but definitely to exude confidence to do some studies. When you before you go to interview, study the background of the school, look at the website. That is already a basic and it's a must, right? Talk to the friends who have who, who are there. Know a little bit if you have insider news and say, oh, I actually know Mrs. Ng, the principal. He is actually formerly from NJC and now he is in let's say uh, uh you know Sota or something like that. You know, so if you know some of these background information, they'll be quite impressed, right? In the interview. I think that one will leave for another conversation. Okay, uh, you want, actually you can unmute yourself, right? Parents, although we sort of like mass mute everyone. Because I think Joey says some parents may want to unmute. Yeah, you can, you can do so now. As long as your background, I think now it's very quiet now, like 10.20, they should be sleeping or playing games. <laughs> uh, where to keep the lookout for DSA interview? Oh, they will actually inform you, right? Because I'm not in MOE now. Definitely, by 1st June, you will apply. They will inform you on a certain day. I, I don't have it offhand right now, but it's all in the MOE website or on the school's website. They will inform you whether you are successful or not, and then let you know when is the interview. And with the pandemic now, it's 99% Zoom <laughs> or Google Classroom. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, for sports, you can't be playing basketball and volleyball and show them how you play it in the Zoom. You know, but for instruments and other things, uh, they will certainly ask you to play, you know, the piano, play whatever that can be done via virtually. But you can't be running. <laughs> you have to show the cross-country records and whatnot. Okay, so they will do what they can uh, to be fair and to get your child to exercise his or her talent. Okay, is programming as all of us subject? Wait, what happens? 
I'll go through quickly one by one. Huh? What happens if the kid really cannot handle the struggle? Okay, so if you, after the DSA, you your kids struggle, uh, number one, the child, the school will definitely help. Number two, you don't spend tons of money on tuition. And yeah, you can come to my center. But that's not the point. It's the child's emotional you know, well-being, you know, um, because to be a small fish in a big pond is quite hard. The worst thing that can happen, uh, I share with you um, one school, I wouldn't want to name names, uh, it's a girls' school, quite a top girls' school, uh, IP program. They have a class, and so sad uh, because the school leaders of the school actually told me, you know, when I was a new VP, that this is a last class. In an IP school, the last class is the class that does O level, it means they are not doing well. At SEC 2, they were put into a class or even SEC 3. So they are actually gearing to take O level while the, more, the brighter ones, the, those who are doing well, are do, doing the true train. You understand what I'm saying? So at SEC 4, only these class of students, girls, who are very bright, you know, just that somehow they couldn't co, you know, some of course not so bright academically, they got it via DSA. Some are quite bright, got into it, then later they struggle. And then at SEC 3, SEC 4, they are in an O-level class. And in that school, it's considered a last class. But they are actually 2, 4 something, you know. You, you know what I mean or not? It's very bad for them emotionally. You know, if they go to any neighborhood school, they are the top of the whole school. First in level, Andrew Kang. Wow, wow. <laughs> you know, but then if I go to this school, I'm last. You know what I mean or not? So which one do you want? First in level. Or you want your child to be last in a top school. You know, so these girls are it really breaks my heart. Like, I look at them, it's like, wow, quite bright, blah, 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 blah. But they're in the last class, you know. Uh, and doing all of it's like, what a shame. <laughs> you know, you're in IP school and you're you're preparing to do all levels. Okay. And of course, some students in certain IP school that has no O-level class, they will be, not so nice to say kicked out, huh? transfer. Okay, transfer is a nice word <laughs> to a school, a normal school, lah, so to speak, to do the O-level at SEC 3 and then SEC 4. You have to understand that IP schools consider our top schools. Um, let me see. Right? Then yeah, I think you can... Uh, uh, unrecord, unrecord now. <laughs> Thank you. I think it's also 